Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. And, and so, you know, when we came in, for him to, uh, I mean, what Saturday the Times was basically done, but with Love Sexy, you know, he started letting us, you know, participate in the tracking of some of the songs. And then later on, you know, when you get up to the Symbol album, it, it ain't even him doing the basic track. You know, it's us. So, I, you know, I, I felt uh, honored by that, that he would trust us enough to do that, you know. Yeah, yeah, so I so, mean, everyone needs to know you're you're a founding member of the MPG itself, right? I mean, yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. Any idea how he came up with that name? The new power generation. Yeah. You know. So uh, nobody's ever asked me that. So I don't know if I'm be hung on the cross for this or not. But I think it may be as simple as. <laughs> Him surfing the internet, and I think there was some um, there was some company that was a new startup or something, and they and they were calling themselves the New Power Generation. Now fans are going to be, you know they're going they're going to chime in and like Levi, I don't know what he's talking about, but I believe it actually happened like that. And he thought it was a cool name. And so he's like, yeah, that'd be a great name for a group, which I, th I think is a cool name. But I think it happened like that. Okay. To be honest, yeah. Yeah. Well, something you may not know is that my, son, my only son was named so that his initials are MPG. Uh, it could be that, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's no, no, no. I'm saying Prince inspired us to name our son after the band. Oh. So his initials were MPG. Really? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, That's, okay. Well, give me the full name. Give me the full name. Well, the full name is Nathan Parker. And then you know my last name, I think, Goldfine. So, yeah. um, Nathan is because of Nate and Sign of the Times, have a boy named him Nate. Oh, okay. And uh, Parker, because uh saw uh, Maceo play at the House of Blues, and Maceo is my sax hero. And uh, Prince yeah. came and turned that show out. He actually showed up and blew the roof off the house of blues that night and took over Maceo's show. So, uh, middle oh, name okay. Parker. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah, want to yeah. seem like a, too much of a fanatic either, like you're saying, you know, and say all oh, my name, yeah, yeah. Prince, you know, but I had to do something. <laughs> Man, I had, a, I had a, an experience like that on the first Prince uh, celebration at Paisley Park. When we played, um, there was uh, some fans from Scotland, and they were like, Levi, come take a picture with us. And I'm like, okay. And so uh, there was mother, father, son, and they were like, yeah, squeeze in there. And then they, they was like, yeah, Levi, go to the right. Go to the right a little bit. And I'm like, I can't go no further. They're like, we're not talking about you. We named our son Levi after you. <laughs> I'm like, what? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that was an interesting experience. Well, that's got to you know? make you feel pretty good. Yeah, and I'm black, he's white. <laughs> so it, that's cool. it ain't even close. <laughs> I was going to say, actually, uh, you're the first Levi that's been on. I've done almost 300 of these. You're the first Levi on the show. So, <laughs> Really? Okay. Yeah. You've got to talk to Levi Stubbs. 
<laughs> yeah, right. That's the only other one I can think of, actually. I don't know any other Levi's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what, uh, you know, there was a big change with uh, Diamonds and Pearls and, and, the, and the Love Symbol album, and you guys started getting to do a lot more, in term, like you were saying, in terms of, uh, you know, coming up with some of the writing and some of the more of the music and all that. Uh huh. Why, why do you think Prince decided to let you guys do more? Now, one thing you have to understand about Prince, Prince is not going to do anything just to make somebody feel better. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say that again for the fans. Prince is not going to do anything just, just so you, like, you know, yeah, I think you deserve it, and you've been here a long time. No, it ain't like that. So there was a couple of things, a couple of few things that he heard. He said, hey, you know, that, that sounds good, you know. So in other words, if he doesn't like it, he ain't, no. He's not putting it in there. But if he hears something that he feels like can be a part of what he's doing, then he's glad to do that. Because he understands, you know, we all were trying to be, you know, uh, you know, better writers and producers. But he ain't going to sacrifice his career for it, no. <laughs> so part of it was, you know, um, yeah, that's a different, slightly different sound, but it still had to fit within whatever he was um, planning. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, do you think it was he, he felt like he needed to just shake up his sound a little bit and you guys brought that to the table, so he yeah. went with it? No, because he's never, like, he's not, he's never been one for... Uh, you know, like it's short on ideas and things to do. No, he's always got a hundred things in his head. I think that he actually liked what he heard and he, now he's going to put his touch on it. You know, it ain't going to go as is, but um, so I think he felt like that was part of his sound. Part of his sound is absorbing from other musicians. You know, when I, the, the, I love the time period when he was with Wendy and Lisa, because I can hear their influence on him. And at times, you know, I can hear it. When Dez was around, I could hear it. I could hear that influence. So um, it's still going to be the Prince show at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. It just uh, was a little more organic sounding, more real instruments, less of the electronic. And um, oh, also, I think, I think, also, I think also I bringing some rap yeah. element into it also. I think I know what you might be asking me. Now it it is all it was always his dream to to like James. You know, you have a band, you have a song idea, and you go in there and they just knock it all out at the same time. Because he says, you know, if you can put the energy from the live stage on record, that's the ultimate. So he felt like. He says, oh, you know, I got a recording band. And he was proud of that. He talked about that all the time. And because uh, we were in the studio all the time, man. And he loved the idea that he didn't have to go in and lay down each of the instruments, although he could do that. But it's a different feel when, you know, when you hand it off to Michael Bland. You're like, whoa, that's what I was hearing in my head. I didn't know that. You know, it's a different thing. So I think that's what was going on. It was a long, long time, you know, fantasy coming true that he like, I got a recording, man. I could do my thing. Yeah. And I think the other thing is he wanted to be able to just concentrate on his guitar, piano, and vocal. Hmm. Like, cause he, cause he uh, was always trying to grow as a musician. And he's like, well, how can I grow if I got to do all the, you know, leg work on this and that? You know, I want to be a better guitar, so I got a rhythm section, let them do their thing, and then I'll do my thing on top of that. You mentioned uh, the guitar. You know, one of the, you know, countless amazing things about Prince to me is that in listening to him from the beginning is how he even upped his game on instruments like guitar. I felt like his guitar playing actually reached new levels after he was already a superstar you know it's like yeah yeah how many superstars continue to you know yeah ascend 
in their and what they can do musically. Well, that's that that's that absorbing thing I was telling about. That's one of his gifts, you know. Um, Prince was never the one to go. Oh, you know that guy's great. He's not gonna. He's not gonna. There's a few like that. Jimmy. Um, let's see, he loves Santana. You know, so that's I think three or four of them that he would probably say that. But there, but Prince might hear somebody, and he even though he might not acknowledge them. He'll go, you know, I want to add part of what they do to what I do and transform and make it purple. But if you're doing that everywhere you go, man, you know, you, you're a monster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What What do you think, say, um, maybe a misperception about Prince that, um, you know, or what? what did you find like a little surprising about him once you got to know him uh, based on, you know, before you got into his circle? Um, that, that There were some people that thought he was very, man, he's different, almost weird. And he wasn't weird at all. It was, a, it was always a plan to everything. You know, um, you know, you know, it, you know, even that thing with him and Michael, you know, you know, Michael was kind of, uh, you know, he, Michael's kind of the good angel, you know, and Prince is like, I'm going to be rude boy, you know. You know, it wasn't, I mean, it, it was natural, but it was also calculated too. It's like, oh, I'm not doing what they're doing. I'm going to do this here. Like I said, you know, earlier on in this interview, you know, a very intelligent guy and he was, everything was planned out. So he wasn't just this weirdo, you know. I mean, everything was orchestrated, you know, and that's what geniuses do. You think they're just slow. They're just coming up with the stuff. It's like, no, they thought it out. And then when you map it out, you'll see the whole plan, you know. So that was very different for me when I met him. Yeah. And then, you know, people have talked about how he was, uh, you know, really had a good sense of humor, too, and. Oh man, funniest dude on earth. I mean, now, now I'm sure this is this has been in a lot of interviews, but even you know the Morris Day character, you know, a lot of that is Prince. Uh, and even Morris talked about that because you know when Morris first when Prince gave Morris the idea of being in front of the band, he said, "Morris, just put your hand in your pocket and be cool. You know, don't don't sweat." Just, just do your thing, man. And it worked. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, oh, yeah, man, he'll have you on the floor if you're in the, in the room with him. Yeah, oh, man, funny. Yeah, it sounded like you guys had a lot of fun doing, like, um, you know, things like that MPG project. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, man. Um, the mad, you know, Madhouse Three never came out, but we, we, you know, we sit around. What do we want to call this this song? And they had crazy titles, you know, um, because we gave the third album names instead of numbers. But yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of fun, man, a lot of fun. And you basically wrote um, tracks like uh, "Sexy MF" and. Sexy, sexy amount uh, kind of came together in kind of a different way. That that title, that was something I I used to just play around with on the road. After we finished, I'm saying, you know, we some sexy, you know, and I'd just be joking about it. And I didn't know Prince was paying attention to that, right? So when we got home, he had a recording session, and uh, so he he gave Michael drunk Michael playing kind of the idea of that beat and then Michael transformed it into what it is now. Um, then he said, Levi, put some chicken grease on it. You know? <laughs> so that's uh, where I just kind of strummed the chord over and over. Kind of a James Brown thing. And then, uh, so we got the groove together now. So then he put the bass line on. And then he said, you know that thing you was playing around with on the road? I need you to sing that right here. So we go bump, 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 and then I sang it, and that's how the song happened. Yeah, that's a true, that's a Hollywood true story. 
<laughs> is there one or two concert or live performances that just are really in your memory for some particular reason, like just was unforgettable for whatever reason? Uh, Special Olympics. Now it's not a whole two hour thing. We man, when I watch, even when I watch it now, I'm like, whoa, my eyes are big. I'm like, man, we smoking, bro. It don't get no, it don't get no higher than that, man. And we had all these arrangements, and I was just like, man, I would not want to follow that act. <laughs> no, no way. Like the, what they say, uh, leave the stage smoking. Oh yeah, that was one of those moments. Then we did one um, in Germany that um, and it, it was a televised concert. Um, it might have been a Love Sexy Tour. We televised it live. Yeah, there's a pro shot video of that. Yeah, I think it was that concert. Now, that one was, uh, man, we was, man, we were so nervous before that show because what happened was before the concert, Prince had this way of like keep adding things to the show, you know, before we go on stage. Like, it's, I mean, everybody knows that when we, we, you know, Prince is notorious for sound checks, right? We had these two or three hour sound checks every day. And what usually would happen, Prince had his notebook, like I said earlier, and he's watched the show two or three times since we did the last one. And he's got notes on every song. All right, song number two, I have a new intro. And it goes like this. And we're playing it tonight. So we go, okay. All right, um, on Raspberry Beret, I want a whole other groove. And then we're going to add um, a guitar solo with this arrangement. It's like 10 things like that. Now, we, we could remember uh, a lot of things back then. The problem that night is we were, is a televised concert. And as music director, I said, Prince, you know, can we, can we just play what we played the last show? I mean, it's televised. I mean, I just think, like, let's hit a home run with home run material, <laughs> you know? And um, he's like, no. He said, do you know, can you imagine their faces when we add all this new stuff? You know, it was kind of that Michael Jordan thing. They asked Michael, what were you thinking about six seconds before you took the last shot? And Michael said, I was, I was imagining myself at the party, the after party, and everybody said, Mike, how did you make it? He would imagine that before taking a shot. I and, mean, you know, that's another genius, Michael Jordan. So Prince had the same thing. He's like, no, man, they're going to they love it. And so... It's 20 minutes before showtime, and I'm trying to calm the band down because they're like, man, this is the wrong night to be doing all this extra stuff. I mean, we already have a two and a half hour show. So Prince, you know, he, he said, you know, everybody go out there and have a good show. Remember, we're recording tonight, though. Don't forget that. <laughs> I want all the dances and everything. They're like, okay. And then two minutes before the show, he said the same thing. So everybody was going off, you know, a little little nervous. But we took that energy and, and uh, you know, hit a home run, man. Some, and I, that's another thing I learned with him. It's like sometimes you got to dive off the cliff, man. Because, you know, it, there's no reason to be nervous because the audience, they want you to have, they want you to do the best show you've ever done. So they, they're not trying to make you feel nervous. They want They want you to be incredible. So Prince said, go and be incredible, <laughs> you know. And then we then we now it's recorded. It's recorded history. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when I watch those shows, I get nervous. Like, I hope I hit the right note. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I have to catch myself, you know. But it's that intense, you know, in a print show. A lot of keys, man. What was the worst flub you ever saw him do? I mean, I'm sure whatever it was, he was so smooth covering it that no one noticed. But uh, a flub, I don't, you know, like on stage where he maybe just, I don't know, missed a cue or something. Or yeah, you know, Prince Prince trained us to even if you make a mistake, he said do it again. 
Miles Davis, you know, I had experience with Miles Davis through Prince. Miles Davis, he'd always say, there are no bad notes on the piano. Did you know that? I'm like, no, I didn't know that, Miles. He said, it just matter, it just matters how long you stay on that note. And I was like, really? So he he said, okay, play this chord progression. And so he's soloing, and then he says, now pay attention. And then he starts hitting these bad notes on purpose. But he but he would play them over and over and make a cool rhythm out of it. So what 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 could have been bad. It's now kind of interesting. You know, he said the audience only perceives it as bad when you react to it. You go, oh, and you go, ah, oh, they go, ah, oh, got you. I saw your face. You know, and, um, but I wouldn't, Prince has never made a flub to me. The only thing I could say that happened on stage that I thought might have been a little strange is when we did the, uh, the get off video on MTV, you know, when he showed his butt, you know, that night. Yeah. So he does this, you know, you know, he does a lot of tricks with the mic. So he did a trick with the mic, but I don't know if the timing was right. And he kind of hit himself in the mouth with the mic. And if you look at that video, you'll see him, you will he'll catch himself. Other than that, I, I never really seen him do a flub on stage. Because he'll turn it into something else. That's incredible. And with all the dance moves and everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So got to go on. <laughs> Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, uh, what project are you most proud of being part of with Prince? Wow. I said the symbol album. Because I, you know, and I, I only realized that after I was out of the band. Because things were moving so fast back then, it was hard to, like, execute and then take it in at the same time. So later on, you know, a lot of people say, man, I'd, I'd ask the fans, like, what, you know, say, they say, oh, that symbol I was incredible. I'm like, really? Because I didn't listen to it anymore. After we recorded it, I kind of tucked it away. They said, you need to pull that out and listen to it. Um, and so I finally did years later. And I felt like that was kind of the, the peak of the band coming together, you know, and gelling and everything kind of working. And uh, I would probably say that project. Yeah, I love that album. I always was more partial to that one than Diamonds and Pearls. I thought that definitely you know, it took it to another level for that group, for that band. Yeah. I mean, Diamonds and Pearls was, to me, Prince showing the world, like, I, I haven't forgotten about R&B. And he's got Rosie there, and he's like, matter of fact, I got the next Aretha Franklin, you know? So, you know, and so that was the, to silence the critics, I think, you know? Yeah, and get a bunch yeah, of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> When he did Batman, did were you aware of that at all? And did, did you wonder why he was kind of doing it off on his own, or what happened with that? Um, um, I, I was I was on the album, but we we were doing like uh, he pretty much did that kind of by himself, and then he said, "Come in and bring some vocals, and some hand claps, or put a little guitar part here, whatever." But mostly that album was mostly him. No, I just saw that. I thought it was a great move, you know, because that was, to me, the beginning of this whole superhero thing that we got going on now. I mean, that was pretty much the, the launch of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there again, he was at the forefront of it. Now, when the album actually came out, I'm like, Prince, uh, just a question. You know, this album really has nothing to do with Batman. <laughs> He's like, you know, he's like, you know, then he said, uh, you know, everything with Prince was sexy, you know. He's like, no, you don't leave. I had to put my sexy sauce on it. I can't just let them have it like they want it. <laughs> and, uh, but it, the Batman album is incredible too, man. Definitely. How, how was yeah. the Graffiti Bridge experience for you, the movie itself? 
Um, I mean, I mean, it was, I mean, first of all, making a movie was uh, quite an experience. Um, it was interesting because you know we, you know, Jimmy and Terry was around. It was like uh, a, a lot of the Minneapolis family all in one spot, you know. So that that was interesting, and then you know, Spike Lee, he came and hung out on the set, and some other celebrities. So it was a lot of side things going on that were very, uh, very uh, interesting. So it was interesting to watch something from start to finish and be in part, being a part of it, you know. Had you met yeah. George Clinton before that? Uh, yeah. I mean, how could you not meet George Clinton? Yeah, yeah. have you been to Paisley Park? Yeah, but anyway, no when you go there, you remember what I'm saying. I mean, it's this real ethereal place, and you got the doves over here, a lot of paintings and uh, uh, pastel colors and all this stuff. So when you get somebody like George Clinton walking through there, come on, man! You know, you he changes the whole vibe of everything. You know, he is the funk, Mister Funk Man, and so. Um, and, you know, of course, he was on Paisley Park Records, so uh, I got to record with him a little bit. Uh, you know, the thing with George, George is like a genius, like for real. Like he has, like, you know, degrees at colleges. A lot of people think he's just, you know, off the top of his head. I mean, that that dude, like, like when he, uh, he told me he had, I don't know if the book ever came out, but there was a I mean, I'm trying to think of a Funktopia book or something that explains all of the language of Parliament. Mm. Like he said, Levi, you know, all those weird albums, Cosmic Slop and all them songs. He said, those are, those songs have meaning. They're not just weird names. Um, the, the spanking of the war babies or something. I mean, you know, it, he said, no, 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 no. And he broke all that stuff down. I'm like, all of that behind those songs? He's like, yeah. He said, you thought we just high and just making up stuff? Oh, no, no, no. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, I had some interesting days with George Clinton. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. His, his wordplay is very ingenious. Yeah, yeah. And how he thinks of music. Because, you know, he's not really a musician. But he knows when things are right. No, he's like, no, nah, that bass ain't sloppy enough, you know. And the bass man's like, well, what do you mean by sloppy? <laughs> you know, you know, it ain't got enough college screens on it. You know, he's talking like that. Put some cornbread with it, you know. <laughs> you're like, I mean, I understand what he's saying. But if you if you if you're not familiar with that kind of language, you're like, what is he talking about? Yeah, well, it's just like if you don't really know, I mean, funk itself is hard to describe. You can sort of describe it technically, but you got to really just be able to feel it to know what funk is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so around the mid 90s, you kind of went your own way. Why, why did you go your own way eventually from Prince? Uh, You know, um, first of all, you know, I tell everybody when you when you work with Prince, you have to multiply everything times three. So, you know, if, if you if you did one year with Prince, it feels like three. If you did ten years, it feels like thirty, because it, he he packed so much stuff in that time period, man. Like your tongue is literally hanging out of your mouth. And then your brain is like, okay, I just want to rest, you know, because it's it's always more, 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 which I was fine with. But at a, at a, at a point in your life, you're like, okay, I think I'm good. <laughs> I think I think I got all that I'm gonna be able to to uh, to maintain or think about a process, and so I'm gonna take my chips and I'm cashing them in now. So part of it was that. Um, the second part is I didn't know, I didn't quite understand 
um, the direction of some things at the time. I didn't quite, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. And I felt like, well, you know, there's a point where you have to say you graduated, you know? Um, and then now, because after you graduate, then you say, okay, now I have to figure out how to take care of myself, you know, in this music business and see what I can add or what, you know, have I learned anything? And if I have, now it's time to put it to good use. And so that's what I felt inside. So that was part of the reason. And um, I think I was just, um, I had a little travel fatigue. I was just like, okay, I've seen the world about five, five times now. You know, I'm ready to be at home. I had no children. Because, you know, in that world, you're missing out on everything. You, you know, so so those three reasons. Yeah, well, I'm with the MPG. Finally, was doing some American touring again, so at least you got that out of your out of your way too. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah, sir. Um, I think I saw that show at um, Universal Amphitheater in LA. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you left in '93 or '94? Yeah, right in the middle there. So, so. Be yeah, before the Glam Slams opened up. No, 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 no. It was after that. About a year after that, I think. Somewhere okay. around there. I, I stayed in Minneapolis for a while. Yeah. Um, and did you, um, what do you think of Prince's musical output after you left over the years? Oh, uh, you mean the quality of it or just yeah, the, yeah, the, from, the amount? For, no, the quality from emancipation on through the stuff he did later, like musicology and even the later stuff. Uh, how much did you keep up with it? And what did you think about it? Oh, I, I always keep up with it, even to this day. You know, uh, they did uh, Welcome to America. I mean, I have everything, you know, because um, I think with an artist like that, because Prince doesn't really write. He doesn't he, he doesn't write bad songs. It's just a more of a matter of do I like that or not, you know. But he's, you know, he's honed his his skills in. He's a great songwriter. He does a, a many Hey, I think I wrote a good one. They look up on something. It's not like that with him. So, so I know that anything you know, that I uh, purchase of his, it's going to be on a certain level, no matter what. Um. And I think artists like that, you always have to pay attention like to what they're doing. You know, um, even Stevie, you know, I, I for, for me, I think peak Stevie Wonder is songs in the key of life for me. But if it, when it whenever he releases other things, I still go buy it. Because you can't you never can count an artist like that out. Yeah, I wish Stevie would release more stuff. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can see back there. Welcome to America is back there, actually. Oh yeah, okay, I see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, yeah. I, re I really liked it, actually. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I like almost all of them, but I, I was, it was better than I anticipated it might be. Right, right, right. And uh, uh, you know, my my only advice was, uh, I had I had had a quick talk with Warner Brothers about some of the future releases, you know, because, you know, there's this rumor and Prince is part of it, you know, that it's like, well, you know, my, the best, my, my best materials in the vault. And I, and I think, you know, it's okay to say those kind of things, but I just like, Hey, whatever's there, let's just listen and everybody decide what it is. Because you know, um, I actually like Purple Rain more to Purple Rain more today than when it first came out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's incredible, man. And I don't, I don't know what ta he tapped into to come up with that, man. But <clears throat> and that's why still today, you know, you can't go anywhere and not play those songs. So there you must know? be there must be a lot in the vault that has some of your playing on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Prince got thousands of recordings, man. Like, like that was like us exercising every day. That was like, okay, 
let's just go in the studio just because, you know, do two or three songs or ideas or whatever. That was just normal. So, you know, and over the years, that's a lot of takes, man. Yeah. Is there anything that you remember in particular that you're like, you know, why didn't he put that out? Oh, man. Uh, well, I think all of us kind of slowly coming out in bits and pieces. And and I'm, what I'm having to do is put the pieces together like, oh, that's when we did this. And then there's three other songs. Where are the other three songs that go with that? I'm kind of doing that thing now, you know. But I think eventually it'll all be out there. I just think they ought to take that take that bar off. Like, well, what we have in the vault is going to be better than Purple Rain. Let's not give it no titles, you know. Let's just let 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 the fans decide what they think of it, you know. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, I mean, how do you all write that all the time? You know, it's like it's a nice idea, but how do you all, you know? Also, it's so subjective, too. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, um, yeah, I agree. Were you uh, surprised um, six years ago now when uh, there was such a global outpouring of love for Prince when he left? Man, I'll tell you, man, you know, um, what to me, you know, when Michael died, I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, the whole world stopped. You know, even even Barack couldn't get on TV during that time. They had him on a ticker tape at the bottom. I'm like, wow. And Michael's went on forever, you know. You know, James, all the other people that died during that. And I said, what I wonder what it's going to be like if that ever happens to Prince, you know. Um, I knew it would always be, you know, major news, but I didn't know it was going to have the impact that it did. And it's still going on, you know. People are like, ah, oh, I can't believe he's not here, you know. So uh, I, w- I wasn't quite prepared for that. I, I remember that on the day he died, and I'm watching the news, you know. You know, they were like, Some- something happened at Paisley Park. And I just kind of dismissed it. I was like, oh, some crazy fan that got in the building and something got out of control. I never thought it would have been Prince, man. And then, you know, um, I don't know how this happened. I had got a call from the coroner's office before they actually went on the wire and said it was Prince. And they said, uh, Levi, you know, I know you're close to him, man. So that's him. He's he, he, he dying, man. I'm like, what? Man, I, I couldn't believe it. Man, I had to pull over the car um, and and soak that up. I mean, <clears throat> I, I think it took me a couple of weeks before I was kind of even normal. Mm-hmm. You know, because, I, cause I, you know, Prince was like the energy ball. You know, he just, you never thought about him leaving before everybody else. You know, all yeah. that energy, you know, he's going to be here forever. He seemed above mortality somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little bit, yep. It just, what boggles the mind, though, too, is you talking about how organized he was with everything, you know, and to yeah. not have left, like, you know, instructions what to do with his music when he was gone is just mind-blowing. Yeah, man, that's like, um, not to get on the invest. I don't want to get on the uh, investigative side of this. It's like, I mean, we, who knows? We don't, we don't know, man. It just you know, you know, and you know, in the time period we live in, anything could have happened. This is what we were told, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, it just uh seems to conflict with what you know I felt yeah, like that Prince. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't even make any sense, man. Yeah. The purple ones. When did you get involved with that, Levi? Um well that happened uh maybe uh, about three or four months after his death, uh, you know, I was I was never the musician that kind of hung out at clubs and things like that. Like a lot of people are mad at me, like man, you don't ever hang out. I'm like, well, for me, I always looked at it as going back to the office. 
you know, like, um, you know, that's where I work at, you know, if I do events. So, so for me to just go out and hang at clubs and go to events, I'm like, I'm, going, I'm not going back to the office, you know. So, but anyway, um, there was this event and they were going to honor Prince in San Francisco. Uh, and the guy, this guy named Morty Oakens, who's a, he's the, he's the leader of the uh, purple ones. He started that off and he, he had been trying to reach me for four or five years before Prince died to like, you know, come and play some music with them. And I, you know, and I didn't know, but anyway, he finally got in touch with me and I said, well, you know, since Prince is gone, maybe I need to go do this, you know, hang out with the fans that I helped me with the whole, his passing. So I agreed to it. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we got through that, that night and I said, okay, this might be kind of cool, but I have to make some changes with the band. You know, uh, I need to, we need to bring it up to a, you know, kind of a different level and different sound. And so he agreed. And so I've been with him ever since, man, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, now I feel like it's starting to uh, to grow a little. We we going up and down. We, we pretty much play in California, but we going we starting to go up and down the coast now. Yeah, and uh, there's some 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 offers to go national. Maybe we'll do that next year. But it, it's been a good release. Um, so I, you know, at home I can still be a part of that music. I mean, it's never going to be the same without Prince. I don't, you know, I don't never get into it like that. Even with the new power generation, I'm like, hey, man, we're still a tribute band. <laughs> you know, even though we're a part of it, because um, it's not going to be the same without Prince. So we don't even shoot for that. We don't even go for that kind of stuff. We just go play the music. and Because um, what I didn't realize is that a lot of Prince's fans have never seen him live. They've only heard the music on the radio and records, but they've never been in the room and actually heard it. So, because I was kind of torn about that, I didn't really want, I said, I don't know if we should go out and do that. And the fans told me, like, please do it because we, we did not get to see him. And this is maybe the closest thing we can get to that. Mm -hmm. So, please go and play. Um, and then it's weird, like, you know, so when we play, it's almost like they imagine him being there playing with us. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we did the, the very last celebration at Paisley, we did, it was called Glam Slam 92. Have you heard about it? Is that where they had uh, like a video of him or a oh, screen? Oh, man. Oh, man. At the end of that concert, man, people were crying because it really felt like he was there with us, you know, kind of playing and rosy. And we're uh, we trying to see if we can continue that a little bit. Because, man, it, it don't get no... I mean, for an artist not being here, to see something like that, man. Even I on stage was like, wow, this is a trip. You know? Uh, but anyway, anyway, that's how I got with the Purple Ones. And uh, we're just trying to represent the music and, you know, for those who can't get to Minneapolis or whatever, and well, at least in California, if you want to hear some Prince music, come on, check it out. Well, you know, for me, I've never been into tribute bands, um, but the bands that take the great songs and make it their own and do something different with it, but still keep yeah. the spirit and flavor and feel of what it's about. That's right. fantastic. You know, and I feel that yeah. what I've heard of the purple ones, you guys do that. You mix it up, you make it a little different, you make it your own, but you keep that, yeah. you know, vibe alive, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's that's what we're trying to do. So, so far, not going to win, <laughs> you know. Uh, we, we, we seem to be doing that, and we're going to try to keep making it better, man. Yeah. Do you anticipate the new power generation doing more shows or now that the pandemic's kind of eased up oh yeah yeah we got one this week in arizona and if you go to the new power generation on facebook or npg.com the info is there but uh yeah i gotta get out of town this wednesday <laughs> mm. 
Yes, sir. Uh, um, and I want fans to know while I have you, Levi, you know, the, the breadth of what you've done, you know, it goes way beyond Prince. I mentioned a little bit of it, but I mean, you were in Jody Watley's touring band, I think, and Sounds of Blackness. You've done a lot of stuff with them. And uh-huh. uh, even things like I saw on, on there, like uh, Paul Schaefer's band and the Jets way back when. And Yeah, man. You're going way back now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it yes, matters, sir. man. It matters. People still love that music, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And you even worked a little bit with Eric Gales. Is that right? You know, uh, Eric Gales is one of my, man, that dude can play this. I love Eric Gales. Oh, man, he on fire. So um, what happened with that, so we haven't met each other. We never met. So uh, Daryl Anders, uh, bass player, he had a project. Uh, he's from the Bay Area. And you know, him and Eric know each other, and Eric agreed to play on this record. But then Daryl called me and says, well, like, you know, Eric, is, you know, he's doing that, but I, I need to put some of your feel on the record, too. So I'm like, man, I don't know. You got Eric on there, you know. So I said, well, let me see what I can hear. So I put my thing on there, and he's like, oh, man, that's a great combination. And then I did a couple of other songs. So we, oh, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, okay, so here's something I'm kind of proud of. So um, on Eric Gale's solo album, a friend of mine named Greg Sane, who lives in Minneapolis, they and call him G. He's been on the show. Yeah, G Sharp. Oh, yeah, G Sharp. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, well, you know the story then. And uh, so him and Eric, like, they almost grew up together, you know. And so Greg told him about a couple of songs that me and him had wrote a long time ago. And Eric, uh, Eric, uh, he liked the song, so they they recorded it. And then they put um, this artist named Tone on the lead vocals on the song. Um, and I'm, so I'm like, oh, my God, Eric Gales is playing a song that I had Writer's credits in it? I mean, like, man, it don't get no better than that. You know? So I was proud of that, man, because I really like that dude. And so for our worlds to kind of come together like that, it's, man, couldn't ask for more. Yeah, I didn't realize I had him on, uh, like, last year and Eric Yales. And I didn't realize he had so much tie-in to, like, a lot of Minneapolis families, you know? Yeah, yeah. He's a monster player, man. He's the... Oh man, yeah. did you do any interviews with Mono Neon? No, I want to. I hope I'd like to get them. Definitely. Yeah, that's the that's the other monster, man. Yeah. Well, that to me is the the future of uh, purple music. You know, people like that. Now, only thing is, we still need a ring later. <laughs> you know, but when you got talent like that, you know, if you can pull all that stuff together, man, and that's well, what I'm. That's what I want to be a part of in the future is bringing, you know, some talented people together. Because I don't, I think, I think it would have been Prince's wish for us to, to write, write our songs, you know, and see what we can do. See what we, see if we can take things further or, you know what I mean? Instead of like, well, let's just play what was always there. That Prince would have never done that. Is is there any so chance? What, any chance the MPG family might make some new music? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been making some music. Uh, of course, that things don't happen as quick as they do with Prince, but we've been working on some stuff, man. And I've been working on some stuff with the Purple ones too. So hopefully, in twenty three, there'll be some things coming up. That'd be fantastic, man. We need more of that Minneapolis sound for real. Yes, sir. Yeah, Got to keep it alive. Oh, yeah. We're going to keep it alive. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Excellent. Hey, Levi, man, thank you so much for making this happen, especially, you know, with the situation in flux like you are and getting over a cold. I really appreciate it. Much love. Okay. Thanks, man. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. 
I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the Media Services section at funkandstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkandstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Wolfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.